what makes for a more difficult and more easy problem, right? Especially like for AI, right? Like you might think like chess, it's like really hard to play. Like I'm not very good at it, right? So like if computers can like be good at chess, they can be like really good at these other things, right? But actually in a sense, chess is a much more constrained problem, so. Welcome everyone to the Voice of Innovation Fireside Chats. I'm Rachel Gordon, an AI and robotics reporter. We're here to take a deep dive into the future of work and pervasive AI. I'm talking today to Daniel Kokotov, and if you need speech to text services, he's your guy. He's the VP of Speech Technologies at Rev.com. They use AI and humans to deliver true to word accuracy transcriptions and translations, and they do it really well and really fast. Daniel, welcome. Thanks, Rachel. Good to be here. So transcribing interviews for me as a reporter is a colossal time suck. And you know, with so much online media, I've just seen this crazy high demand for enterprise communication needs and a real necessity for the types of tools that you have at Rev.com. And it seems like the use cases here are boundless. Accessibility, legal depositions, you know, law enforcement officials transcribe interviews and use them to present a case. So what are some of the most meaningful applications and the biggest demand that you're seeing in this space? Sure. Well, uh, it was very perceptive of you, you know, like you, you mentioned a few of them for sure. Uh, um, I'll, I'll pick on one, uh, law enforcement. Uh, we actually work with this uh, company uh, called Axon. Uh, mm -hmm. They are a uh, manufacturer of body cam equipment, um, the largest manufacturer, I think, in North, in like North America. Um, and then they have a bunch of software tools for police departments around the country to, you know, mm -hmm. capture the audio from these body cams and kind of be able to quickly like leverage for leverage it for um, writing up reports for, you know, evidence collection and stuff like this. So this is a huge uh, use case, you know, I mean, I think we've all kind of like seen more uh, body cam footage in the last year and a half than like we've ever had before. And, you know, it's, it's extremely important that uh, we get uh, the content of those conversations right you know because you know they affect a lot of people's lives uh and so you know axon found us you know they needed the best um most accurate inscription um but they needed it to be done at scale right uh, because you know officers are in the field all the time uh, and so we're collaborating together and making it you know police officers lives much easier right because you know they record it gets uploaded to Axon service. It goes through transcription with Rev AI, um, and you know they don't have to worry about like forgetting something right when they have to file their reports. Uh, so that's you know one use case. Um, but you mentioned a lot of the others, you know, uh, depositions, interviews, uh, um, things like that. Um, we can maybe talk about others too. Yeah, definitely. Do you feel like the demand here is super diversified or is there one particular area that you see gets a lot of attention and need? Hmm. Uh, it, it's fairly diversified, um, you know, I would say. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are particular ones we for sure um, are excited to focus on. I touched on one, you know, um, mm -hmm. and maybe like the legal space in general to like broaden it a little bit is, uh, is a very exciting one. Um, you know, um, some of the other ones that uh, are really cool, uh, education, uh, right, you know, uh, last year we saw, like, of course, with kind of like the COVID and move to online, you know, uh, kind of having both live transcription uh, and captioning and, uh, you know, offline captioning become much more important, right, because a lot more people were engaging uh, in education via, um, you know, either like Zoom for lectures or like, you know, um, uh, async video content. Uh, so that's huge, right? And accessibility, I would say, is the main theme there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we want to make sure that like everyone gets uh, is able to consume that content in a kind of like fair way. Uh, so that's a big one. Um, and then, of course, like media, right? Like, uh, you know, I like nowadays, I like watch all uh, movies like with captions on, you know, it's kind of become a default for me. Maybe I'm just like, you know, getting old and like kind of hard of hearing. Uh, although I actually read that um, uh, it's a trend like for audio to like be more difficult to uh, to like hear. Uh, generally, like, well, I don't know. It was, it was one article. They were blaming uh, Mike Nolan, you know, who's like uh, or Christopher Nolan, who's like the director, you know, of like Batman trilogy. 
and apparently he was like this progenitor of like more difficult to hear uh, audio. So anyway, um, that's a big space, you know, uh, captioning, subtitles, uh, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I've been using a lot of uh, captions when I'm watching uh, movies and TV as well. And also I love Christian Bale, but I feel like he always whispers. So whenever I'm watching a Christian Bale movie, the captions really come in handy. Right, yeah. Well, you know, it's like, it's very intense, right? You gotta like really lean in, you know, here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he just really leans into the characters, but then his voice somehow drops. Yes. But before I kind of get into the tech and how all of this works, I want to just zoom out a little bit, rewind. I want to hear a little bit more about your background and how you got to this position at Rev.com. And I know that you went to MIT and I know that you also had early exposure to computers through your mom's work. So what kind of happened after that? Sure. Uh, OK, well, I guess we can start with like that, that first one. So, you know, I grew up in Russia, uh, you know, uh, I came to America when I was 13 in 1991. Um, and while I was growing up, you know, my mom uh, is a, was a computer programmer. Uh, and uh, like in Russia, in those days, like no one had a personal computer, right? Like it, it was like pretty much not no one, but not a lot of people, right? Uh, uh, but because my mom worked, you know, uh, as a programmer, I could go to uh, work like to her work uh on occasion right and i would get like you know uh access to one of her pcs right and um well mostly like i was interested in playing video games on it uh but it kind of like, gave me this early like exposure right like to what computers can do and uh, i just like find it fascinating that uh you know you could sort of like write some stuff you know and feed it into the computer right and then i could do whatever whatever you wanted right like uh, it was sort of like limitless what you could accomplish mm -hmm. And how old were you at this point? I was, I guess, I don't know, nine, ten, maybe. Okay, young. Going. Yeah. Uh, you know, like my, both my parents worked, right? So like there was like no one, and uh, my grandparents didn't live with us. So uh, like uh, some days, like well, like I, I could be like alone at home by myself. You know, I didn't have any siblings, uh, or I could like come to my mom's work. So like it was, it was, in a way, it was like just a childcare methodology. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, it's like kind of like, uh, you know, my wife just gave me this t-shirt that says like science, it's uh, like magic, but uh, but real. So in a way, mm -hmm. like, it's, that's how like I thought of computers, right? It's like magic, but real. Um, mm -hmm. So that's why it's so appealing. Uh, so yeah, when we moved to the US, um, you know, one of the first things that um, my parents bought for me, like once we had some money, uh, was a computer uh, and kind of like started teaching myself programming and was pretty sure, like, I guess from an early age that I wanted to be in computer science. Mm -hmm. um, so then, yeah, went to MIT, uh, and uh, I met uh, my co-founders from Rep uh, for Rev there. Um, There's five of us. Uh, we were at MIT together. We're in a fraternity together, and so we always had this kind of dream of founding a company. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, like after we graduated, we all kind of like did our own thing, uh, but the dream was always in the background, you know. And uh, mm -hmm. then in 2011. Uh, Jason, who is the CEO of Rev, um, started calling us up one by one and, you know, it's like, uh, I'm ready, you know, like, let's, let's do it. Um, and he had the idea for Rev. Uh, and at the time, like, uh, the founding mission of the company was to create great work from home jobs. Uh, mm. you know, Jason had uh, worked at this company called Bowdesk uh, prior to Rev. Uh, and they kind of like really uh, started this uh, freelancer work from home trend, right? They focused originally on like programming uh, as a category, but you know, then they expanded to many other things. Uh, so Jason really believed in this and like kind of making it possible for people who couldn't, uh, for whatever reason, or didn't want to have like a traditional job to still be able to participate, you know, in the, in the economy. And he had many ideas about how to make it better, how to make it more like, you know, meaningful. Uh, not like have these freelancers treated kind of like cogs. Uh, and so that was kind of the, the goal for Rev at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and when we started, we started with translation uh, and then we pretty quickly added audio transcription, um, captioning uh, as, you know, kind of our main categories uh, of work. Uh, and at first we kind of thought we would just keep doing this, right? Like we would keep adding new and new like categories, like the sort of um boundary principle was like something you could do from uh from your computer from home um mm -hmm. 
-hmm. but kind of maybe five years in we realized you know this general speech to text field uh right turning um you know uh turning speech into like uh words and like helping people understand it like it was big enough that like this could be really the focus of the company uh mm -hmm. and so um and so that's what we did and um kind of now our vision is to understand every human voice uh, right mm -hmm. so kind of a big problem right like in a sense like not fully solvable problem but we hope to make some progress uh um and yeah and i guess the other big thing is we started working on ai right like so mm -hmm. uh originally it was all about just the freelancers doing the transcription the captioning um mm -hmm. but like in 2016 uh we saw that you know um the deep learning revolution was happening speech to text like uh, speech recognition was improving at a pretty rapid pace uh and we thought like okay we should kind of figure out how it fits into our plans right mm -hmm. uh, and so we hired a couple of really smart people um we worked with this like pretty amazing data set that we've created over over the years of doing human transcription and uh mm -hmm. you know uh the result was kind of like we created the best what we think is the best asr um, and so now it's kind of like humans and machines working together mm -hmm. yeah you definitely have this interesting model that uses both humans and ai to translate and transcribe so what would that relationship kind of look like on a typical project is it project dependent and tell me a little bit more about how your data trained search engine works mm -hmm. uh, yeah i guess uh what's the best way to kind of describe it well first of all you know the way we train our speech recognition engine right is we use um this corpus of uh transcribed human transcribed text right so like mm -hmm. what uh organizations come to us and they need like human level quality right so at that point we have humans doing it uh um nowadays they actually still start with a uh, draft from the speech recognition right but originally they didn't uh um, so, so we've got this like uh, data set, um, and then we feed into the cycle because uh, as they're more productive, right? We can provide a better service to our customers. So they come, you know, th th they order more um, of the human services from us because they're faster. We can make them cheaper. Uh, so that gives us more data, and our AI becomes better as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's kind of like that flywheel, if you will. Um, on specific projects, it just really depends on. Um, what uh, those customers requirements are right so you can kind of imagine uh, if we're doing transcripts for earnings calls let's say like well those need to be like 100 percent accurate right so they're going to want uh, human mm -hmm. quality um, on the other hand uh, if uh, we're doing something where very quick turnaround is extremely important right like you might want something like within minutes of when you have the audio available or even like live. like imagine uh, we actually have a zoom app which could show you uh, a live transcript of our conversation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so there it's just AI. Uh, right. So I, I want to ask you then about that live transcription service that you started in 2019. And then you also created an application programming interface so people can just build speech recognition directly into their programs. So you've right. really adapted as AI and software has progressed. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we basically thought, you know, uh, the stuff is like too good to keep to ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> if I want to put a very altruistic spin on it, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, if I want to put a more like I don't know capitalist spin on it, like we thought it would be a good business, right? Uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, we thought uh, there's our goal is really sort of to bring what we think is the best facial recognition to as many people as possible, right? Like mm -hmm. in the service of this like vision of understand every human voice, uh, right? And so we think there's like two ways to do it, like we can um give it to users directly people like journalists or you know uh, uh lawyers when you, their interviews transcribed um or uh we can also give it to people who are building new experiences new applications right and they need uh speech to text as a kind of foundational part of these new apps uh, so that's right kind of those two ways right the apis for the builders and then um, our rev service for the users
I mean, it, it's crazy because it feels like there's been a step change since Google Translate incorporated machine learning. And, you know, I recently read about DeepMind, how they created this new language model that was beating state-of-the-art models 82% of the time on over 150 different language challenges that they use in testing. So are there more step changes to come here? Like, where are we at in this development cycle? Yeah, uh, I mean, for sure, like we're still pretty mm -hmm. early, right, on this AI journey. Uh, mm -hmm. I can kind of think of it, well, I mean, it's like not a perfect analogy, but, uh, you know, when like in 2007, when the iPhone, you know, came out, right, like we were like, I, I would say like, I don't know, an iPhone 3G, right? We're not, we're not an iPhone 15 yet in terms of this stuff. Uh, so uh, there's a lot more to come. Um, you kind of mentioned like those language models that maybe for a speech track, specifically uh some of the things that like we're excited right uh one um multilingual and cross language right so like right now the english uh for english and for kind of this kind of talk let's say me and you having a conversation it's gotten pretty good asr has gotten pretty good pretty high accuracy uh you know french spanish like also not bad maybe not quite as good as english uh but for those like you know um longer tail of languages like sometimes they call them low low resource languages uh because there's not as much data for them uh it's not nearly as good yet uh also like when we um if we were to like start using multiple languages in the same conversation like uh like i'm russian as we talked about right so uh, when i talk to my parents we kind of talk in this combination of like russian and english and we sleep right. back and forth between them right mm -hmm. and right now like no no speech recognition engine would really handle that very well, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but now there are new techniques, new approaches uh, that are much more amenable to uh, being good at it. So I think that's going to be one of the big uh, challenges, right? And one of the big themes of the next, you know, five to ten years is really like taking speech recognition global, right? Uh, doing better at more languages, doing better at these cross-language situations. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's yeah what I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, it is a cause for concern with these speech recognition tech where these programs are having difficulties with different languages or accents or different speech patterns. And, you know, I think that can sometimes marginalize underrepresented groups. So it's good to hear that you guys are kind of cognizant of that and thinking about that as you incorporate more updates into your, your technology. No, yeah, absolutely. Right. I guess they kind of call it uh, responsible AI as you yes. know, maybe like a total team, right? It's like very, uh, very um, of the of the moment. Uh, uh, but it's you know, it's it's it is really important, right? Because uh, you know, like well, uh, I, I was just talking about this the other day, like with, uh, myself and one of my colleagues who went to this AI summit in uh, New York. Like a, a, a number of companies were presenting, and uh, both of us were talking a little bit about this idea of responsible AI. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the term we use is like with great power comes great responsibility, right? Like uh, as we sort of empower the AI to do more uh, in our daily lives, right? This stuff's really important because uh, if it's making decisions, right? Uh, if people are relying on it, uh, then it's got to get it right. Um, yeah, and there's a number of like aspects to it. You know, there's kind of the explainability aspect. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, there's kind of like the fairness aspect and we can talk about this more if you want but uh yeah we like here believe very much in you know responsible ai and like kind of our our uh well responsibility to get it right yeah yeah and i think with all of those models as well they need to understand why they don't understand when they're making a decision and you know there's no legal framework in place right now for if an ai makes a mistake and i think as you had uh, alluded to you know explainability interpretability and transparency are really these key tenants that we need to be thinking about as we are using you know embodied ai and um more and, and a step towards more general ai as well yeah exactly um yeah, privacy is another one like we didn't mention yet, but hugely important. Uh, yeah, and then, you know, back to your kind of thought about like humans and like machines, right? Like, where is the role for humans? Uh, well, this is like one of the most important ones, right? Uh, kind of like to act as supervisors uh, and uh, 
kind of guardians of this of this AI to make sure it does follow those responsible AI principles. I think there's also a communication problem here. I think a lot of this onus is on science journalists to accurately report how capable AI systems are at this moment, because we know that AI systems are really good at when they're programmed to do a specific task. But I feel like oftentimes if you're seeing a, a headline that uh, an AI is beating the world's best chess player, you think that this is a really general system that is smarter than everyone. And that's just incorrect. So I think we need to be a little bit more explicit when we are describing these systems and staying away from these really splashy headlines where science starts to feel like entertainment. And I think we really, we need to move away from that entertainment value and just get more excited about the applications in more of a straightforward presentation. And I think that's, that's a big problem here. Totally. totally absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think this, theme of like media as entertainment is like in general a big problem in society uh, not yeah. just in this, in this domain uh, but absolutely in this domain um, part of it I think is people don't necessarily have uh, a good like instinct of what makes for a more difficult and more easy problem right especially like for AI right like you might think like chess it's like really hard to play like I'm not very good at it right so like if computers can like be good at chess they can be like really good at these other things right but actually in a sense Chess is a much more constrained problem, so uh, it's right. um, very possible that we have, yes, I mean, pretty much like from now, no human will ever be better at chess than a computer again, right? But um, right. Uh, these are the things, and general intelligence, as you mentioned, they're much more difficult problems because they're much less constrained. Exactly. And I'm terrible at chess, as a side note. I tried to play uh, a couple of weeks ago for the first time, I think, since I was a kid, and uh, I just forgot everything, and I was terrible. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm mediocre at chess, I guess. I'll, I, I won't rate myself as quite terrible, but uh, uh, my dad was pretty good at chess. Uh, well, still is pretty good at chess. Uh, so he, he never quite, I don't know, got me to his level. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Still... I, yeah, that's a, a game that I think I, I would like to improve on, but I find myself gravitating more towards code names and bananagrams and things with words. <laughs> bananagrams <laughs> is a great game. I've been like... Uh, trying to play with my kids a little bit. Uh, they're still like mostly too young. So I think they kind of- uh, So it's your tactic so you can beat them and feel good about it. That's right. And then like when <laughs> they beat me, I can say that like I taught them everything you know about bananagrams and so- Exactly, you know, these are my children. You know <laughs> <laughs> so what about this is compatible hardware? I know I'm shifting from bananagrams to hardware. Okay. But are you, this seemed like a seamless transition because you know, the games, hardware, same thing. But are you looking to create any compatible hardware to these services and systems you provide? And I'm only asking about this because I was thinking about Google's Pixel earbuds that, you know, say they can translate conversations in other languages. So are you interested in that space at all? Um, definitely, we haven't done a lot with it yet. I mean, you know, we're still, relatively speaking, a small company, uh, certainly compared to Google, you know. Uh, <laughs> or in a sense, like the David compared to their Goliath, right? Uh, um, but, uh, well, the, the most kind of obvious one is like, yeah, about better microphones, right? Uh, mm -hmm. there's, um, when people usually these days capture recordings, right? It's, you know, uh, maybe it's with a phone, right? Um, or, or, or something like this. And, you know, it's got a couple of microphones and usually get like a stereo or even mono recording, right? Like if we, mm -hmm. um, and there are these things called array microphones, right? Which can capture like directions and uh, much more information. And that could help down the line, right? Like for speech recognition specifically, right? Because you could much easier isolate different speakers. So you could have better like speaker recognition or speaker diarization, um, attributing who said what. Uh, so that's probably like if we were to go into hardware, it might be to like, you know, build a better uh, kind of mic that any organization could put in their you know mm -hmm. conference rooms right and it would result in better transcription better speech to text uh, but um, that's on sort of still the i don't know uh, the to be done at some point pile uh, right well, what else is on that list for what's next for rev uh yeah good question um you know really it's uh kind of going deeper into these few um verticals that we've you know, really um, kind of identified as the most important for us. Um, 
legal, education, um, healthcare as well. Uh, those are some of the key ones. Uh, and uh, kind of starting to serve more and more use cases. Uh, and like kind of continuing to like broaden this understand every human voice thing, right? So multilingual is one, um, kind of going a little bit beyond uh, speech to text, right? Because ultimately like, you know, speech to text is just the first part of like, you know, uh, understanding the content and kind of making it uh, actionable in a sense, right? But, you know, that still produces a lot of data, right? Uh, um, you know, like, and in the beginning, why do you want to like, you know, uh, transform everything to, uh, 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 with speech to text, right? Like, well, like we're all like participating in these meetings, right? Uh, recording these videos and like, it's hard to like, pick out those key moments later from them, right? Like I at work, mm -hmm. I'm like meetings all the time, right? Uh, and like all the time, I kind of want to say like, oh, what did, you know, so-and-so say in, in this, um, you know, daily check-in we had, right? And it's kind of hard to find. Uh, so the first step is just to have everything transcribed, right? Uh, but that's still like too much uh, with like, you know, uh, or everything we're doing today. So the next step is kind of to be able to say like, oh, here were the key moments from this uh, conversation, right? Uh, and I can, you know, do a search across all my meetings and identify them and um, uh, maybe share them with my team. So, uh, so yeah, it's kind of going beyond just uh, transcription. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see how all of that unfolds. So before we end, I hear that you're a huge David Lynch fan. I'm a huge David Lynch fan. Mulholland Drive is my favorite movie of my whole entire life. Any eternity or life I live in, that will always be my favorite movie. Have you figured that movie out? <laughs> uh, no, that one, it's been a while since <laughs> I thought about um, Mulholland Drive. Uh, but uh, I don't know if you like, did you watch uh, the the season three of Twin Peaks, you know, the yes, new one. Yes, of course. So that one, uh, that's like, uh, I, I came across this amazing YouTube video. I don't know if you've seen it, uh, where this guy like creates, creates this like unified theory of, of, of uh, Twin Peaks, like it's like a four and a half hour YouTube video. And it's like, I mean, it's, it's a college level dissertation. It's like amazing. <laughs> like, I definitely need to watch that. <laughs> Yeah, maybe like, I don't know if they have show notes for these conversations, but if there are, we can post that link because it's, uh, it's, it's the greatest thing, but that's Absolutely. like my latest David Lynch, well, mo my most recent David Lynch obsession, I guess, Twin Peaks, Amazing. a work of art. Yeah, oh my gosh, uh, everything he does is, is art. I, I just need, I want, would love to get inside his brain, have dinner with him. I feel similarly about uh, Salvador Dali, he's my favorite painter, so mm. you're probably sensing a theme here of the type of artist that I like just completely wacky but i have somewhere uh well uh yeah i have a replica dali somewhere in my house uh yeah no, he's awesome but yes maybe like if you have another podcast you know uh David about wacky Lynch. artists <laughs> yeah. yes yeah. well thank you so much this was so much fun talking to you i'm so glad that we had the opportunity to chat and i'm super excited to see everything that rev.com is going to accomplish uh, me too. It was really fun talking to you, Rachel. Thanks.